Tiglath-Pileser III of Assyria might originally have been a rebel, or he might have been someone who suppressed rebels who were trying to usurp the legitimate dynasty. Either way, he hadn't been directly in line for the throne, and he really benefited from a rebellion that broke out in the mid-8th century BCE. This chaotic time ultimately resulted in the legitimate king being deposed and Tiglath-Pileser III taking the throne. By this time, the Neo-Assyrian Empire was the biggest empire the world had ever known. It extended across Mesopotamia, Syria and the Levant, and included parts of Anatolia as well. But the imperial structure was in some disarray. It had been set up more than a century earlier by one of Tiglath-Pileser's predecessors, King Ashurnazapal II, and now it badly needed a reboot. Provincial governors had become quite independent, and rebellions had been occurring in many places. Once Tiglath-Pileser III took power, he instigated many changes, and the Assyrian administration finally mastered the running of an empire. The new king redrew the boundaries of provinces, making them smaller. And his governors, who were now less powerful, depended on him for their positions. The king also created a fast system of communication so that messages were passed between couriers riding on horseback. The messenger and his horse could rest after a day of riding, but the message continued on with a new carrier. So the message never had to pause. It was much like the later Pony Express in America. The king could be informed much more quickly this way about any problems that developed across the empire. Tiglath-Pileser III also expanded the empire into areas that had never been subject to Assyria before, and he forced these lands to pay tribute. The economies of these vassal states were streamlined so that resources were used efficiently. With these reforms during the mid-8th century BCE, the Assyrian Empire reached a period when it was at the height of its power. But only 135 years after Tiglath-Pileser III came to power, the empire fell. One of the foreign lands that Tiglath-Pileser took control of was Babylonia. The Assyrians worshipped Babylonian gods and respected Babylonia as an ancient civilization. Honestly, Assyria was a little bit in awe of Babylonia, and the Babylonians got special privileges under Assyrian rule. But one complication about being brought into the empire was that the Babylonians had a long tradition with regard to their king. Under this tradition, the legitimate king of Babylon had to take the hand of the god Marduk during a special ceremony during the New Year's festival. And that ceremony could only happen in Babylon. The king seems to have literally grasped the hand of the statue of the god Marduk. This gesture and the whole ceremony symbolized the king's devotion to the god and his devotion to Babylon. Tiglath-Pileser III actually did this. Even though, like all Assyrian kings, he was personally devoted to the god Ashur, he took the hand of Marduk and ruled Babylon directly. But at other times, the Assyrian kings put their sons on the Babylonian throne, or appointed Babylonian kings who were loyal to Assyria. Sometimes this worked, but often it didn't. The Babylonians didn't like being ruled by Assyria. They had been a great power for such a long time, more than a thousand years by the time of Tiglath-Pileser III, that they didn't think much of being subject to outsiders. But from the time that Tiglath-Pileser took over, the Babylonian throne changed hands 20 times in just 100 years. That's an average reign of just five years. Plus, the Babylonians had more than just the Assyrians to worry about. A group of people in the far south, called the Chaldeans, also often tried to take over Babylon. It was a mess, and things came to a head during the reign of a king named Sennacherib, ruled Assyria from 704 to 681 BCE. Although Sennacherib started out ruling Babylonia directly, he didn't take the hand of Marduk for some reason. So the Babylonians might never have really viewed him as legitimate. 
After two years, his rule in Babylonia was overthrown. A Babylonian took the hand of Marduk instead. But this man was quickly, quickly deposed by a usurper named Merodach Baladan, who had wanted to rule Babylon for a long time and had the help of the neighboring Elamites. The Elamite kingdom was in the southwestern part of what is now Iran. Of course, Sennacherib was still king of the rest of the Assyrian Empire, and he viewed Merodach Baladan as an evil villain. So he sent in his forces to bring the region back under Assyrian control. Merodach Baladan fled, and this time, Sennacherib put a puppet king on the throne, a Babylonian who was loyal to Assyria. But that didn't work either, and Sennacherib decided that he needed to have his own son on the throne in Babylonia. This might have seemed like a good idea, but it turned out to be a disaster. After a few years, the Elamites raided Babylonia, and they took Sennacherib's son away. We don't know what happened to him. Presumably it wasn't good. The Babylonians once again appointed a local king, and once again, Sennacherib's army showed up to remove him. You can imagine that the Babylonians were getting angrier and angrier with the Assyrians. So again, the Babylonians chose a local king, and this time, they formed an alliance with several neighboring kingdoms, including their former enemies, the Chaldeans and the Elamites, to attack the Assyrian army. They fought a vicious, bloody battle, but neither side clearly won the day. Sennacherib must have been furious. His son was gone, and the Babylonians had repeatedly rejected Assyrian rule. So, in 690 BCE, he took a huge army and he attacked the capital city of Babylon. When the Babylonians didn't give up, the Assyrians set up a siege around the city. These two great powers, they were like twins in a way. Their people spoke the same language. They worshipped the same gods. They had much the same culture and history. Babylonia was the older society, Assyria the younger one but you'd think they would have been natural allies, and now they were enemies. In 689, Sennacherib's forces entered Babylon. They didn't hold back. According to Sennacherib's annals, the Assyrians sacked with a vengeance. They destroyed temples, houses, and palaces, and they redirected the river so that water swamped parts of the city. They even took the statue of the god Marduk away from Babylon. This, of course, wasn't just seen as a statue, it was the god himself. The Babylonians saw the Assyrians' attack on the temples as blasphemy. Even some Assyrians would have been worried. After all, they worshipped Babylonian gods too. Soon after this, the Assyrians began rebuilding the city of Babylon. But the relationship between the two kingdoms was damaged, and the Elamites were now aligned against Assyria as well. Sennacherib had led fierce campaigns into their land too, so the Assyrians were gaining some pretty powerful enemies. Sennacherib had achieved other things in his reign too, of course, besides subduing Babylon. He'd moved the capital to the ancient city of Nineveh, near the modern city of Mosul, and he'd sponsored a massive building program there, doubling the size of the city. Nineveh was absolutely enormous for an ancient city. It covered about 1,750 acres, and its population might have been as much as 230,000. To give you a sense of scale, it was about 15 times the size of Jerusalem at the same time, and had about 23 times as many people living there. The new capital needed a regular water supply for its vast population and for its many orchards and gardens. So Sennacherib oversaw the construction of a 60-mile-long canal that brought water from the mountains. At one point, the canal had to pass across a valley. So the Assyrian engineers created a stone aqueduct 30 feet high. The inscription on the aqueduct says, in Sennacherib's words, over deep cut ravines, I spanned a bridge of white stone blocks. I caused those waters to flow over it. Sennacherib's new palace in Nineveh was bigger and more impressive than the palaces that had come before. Like his predecessor, Ashurnazipal II, from the 9th century BCE, Sennacherib commissioned stone relief sculptures for the walls of the palace. 
that showed his great military victories over his enemies. Some of the reliefs depict gardens on top of buildings. Now, we're used to seeing this in modern cities. You can see trees growing at the tops of skyscrapers in pretty much any city. And Milan even has a vertical forest with trees and shrubs on every balcony. But in ancient times, this type of planting would have seemed miraculous. Imagine the engineering feat involved. First, the walls and the roof had to support the weight of all that soil and water, as well as the trees. Then you had to get water up to the roof, without modern plumbing. Sennacherib's aqueduct helped to make these gardens possible. Stephanie Daly, a historian at Oxford University, has put forward a fascinating suggestion. These incredible gardens at Nineveh, in the northern part of Mesopotamia, might be the source of the legend of the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, even though Babylon was hundreds of miles to the south. Later Greek and Roman authors claimed that a Babylonian king named Nebuchadnezzar had constructed the gardens in Babylon soon after the end of the Assyrian Empire. But there's no archaeological evidence in Babylon for hanging gardens. And no one who visited Babylon at the time, or even for centuries afterward, ever mentioned them, as far as we know. Even the Greek historian Herodotus, who seems to have gone to Babylon in the 5th century BCE and described all the wonders of the city, even he never mentioned a hanging garden. When the gardens were eventually described as gardens on top of a building, they were considered to be one of the wonders of the ancient world. But this was much later, long after the Assyrian and Babylonian civilizations had ended. Now, the Greeks and Romans were forever getting Babylonia and Assyria confused. So it's quite possible that they confused Nineveh with Babylon. And Sennacherib described the gardens of his palace as being a wonder. His engineers even seem to have invented a water screw to pump water uphill, like the one invented much later by Archimedes. So perhaps the ancient wonder should have been called the Hanging Gardens of Nineveh. In any event, the Assyrian Empire was technologically advanced in Sennacherib's time, but it was having problems with its neighbors to the south and east, Babylonia and Elam. In 681 BCE, Sennacherib was assassinated by one of his sons. The prince who took over the throne wasn't one of the deceased king's oldest sons, and he wasn't one of the assassins either. But he was the son of one of Sennacherib's favorite wives, Nakia, and he'd been named crown prince before the assassination. His name was Esarhaddon, and Esarhaddon had to fight his brother for the throne in a brief civil war. The Assyrian army divided against itself. It was a foretaste of things to come. In the coming decades, civil wars in Assyria would become more frequent. Esarhaddon is an interesting person. He was more fragile than his father, and on as many as eight occasions, omens were recorded suggesting that his life was in danger. For example, an eclipse of the sun was a sure sign that the king would die. So he took precautions in the same way that many Mesopotamian kings had done before him. He officially stepped down from the throne and a substitute king was appointed in his place. Esar Haddon took the title of farmer while actually still ruling. After a set amount of time passed, the substitute king was put to death. That way, the omen had come true. And then the real king resumed his throne. The gods had to be right after all. And this way they were, but without the real king having to die. Esarhaddon decided to expand the Assyrian Empire to its largest extent yet, by conquering Egypt. Through thousands of years of civilization up to this time, Egypt had been one of the richest places in the world. It had abundant natural resources, including gold, which everyone else in the region wanted, and its fields produced vast amounts of grain. The Assyrians controlled much of the Levant already. Israel had been conquered by the Assyrians in 722 BCE, and many of its people had been deported across the empire. This is recorded in the Bible, 
as well as in Assyrian records. Other kingdoms in the region had also been conquered. Judah, with its capital at Jerusalem, was supposed to pay tribute to Assyria, but sometimes it failed to do so. It's clear from the Bible, and from other sources as well, that Egypt had been helping Israel, Judah, and other states in the region to rebel against Assyria. So perhaps in Esarhaddon's mind, Egypt needed to be controlled. It didn't hurt that there was immense wealth there that could be looted. But ultimately, the attempt to bring Egypt into the empire didn't go well. The first conquest in 671 was successful, and Esarhaddon gave new Assyrian names to the Egyptian cities. The Assyrians sacked the northern capital city of Memphis, and a northern Egyptian ruler took on the role of being a vassal to Assyria. But the southern part of Egypt wasn't happy with the arrangement, and soon after Esarhaddon left, there were rebellions. So Esarhaddon and the Assyrian army headed back to Egypt in 669 BCE. At this point, Esarhaddon became ill, and he died en route. The Assyrians didn't keep going, and Egypt soon left the empire. Maybe it was just too far away for the Assyrians to control. Although the end of the Neo-Assyrian Empire was still 60 years in the future, we can see, with the benefit of hindsight, that seeds of its failure were sown. The Egyptian campaigns had been expensive. More importantly, they had been unsuccessful. Assyria had always seemed unstoppable before this. The Assyrian army was always victorious. The Egyptian achievement in breaking away must have given hope to some people in the various provinces that perhaps they too might be able to successfully rebel. Meanwhile, the lands of Babylonia and Elam were unhappy with their situation. They had been attacked brutally by the Assyrian army in Sennacherib's time. And even though Esarhaddon spent a lot of wealth and manpower in rebuilding Babylon, the Assyrians still had enemies there. Furthermore, the civil war between princes when Esarhaddon took over had set a precedent. In planning his own succession, Esarhaddon had made one of his sons, Ashurbanipal, crown prince. Another son, Shama Shuma-ukin, was made the viceroy in Babylon. Now, you'll remember that Sennacherib had also tried this. His eldest son had been captured by the Elamites and presumably killed. It wasn't easy to rule Babylon. When Esarhaddon died, Ashurbanipal became king of Assyria and Shammah Shuma-ukin was king of Babylonia, but in a subordinate role to his brother. For 17 years, this system worked quite well. During this time, Ashurbanipal built up his library at Nineveh, and attended to other issues in the northern parts of the empire. Even the Elamites were at peace with Assyria. But in 653 BCE, Ashurbanipal went to war against his eastern neighbors, and he was victorious. A relief sculpture in his palace shows the king in a garden, relaxing on a couch. His wife is next to him, and they're both having a drink. Servants fan them, and birds are flying overhead. It all looks very tranquil. Until you look carefully, and you notice a decapitated head hanging in the tree next to them. That head belonged to the Elamite king. A year after the war, the Assyrian king of Babylon, Shamash Shuma-ukin, launched a rebellion against his brother Ashurbanipal. And not surprisingly, the Elamites helped. Civil war erupted again, ending with Ashurbanipal's troops besieging Babylon for two years. Some of the people still alive in Babylon at this time must have been survivors of the siege of 689 BCE, 40 years before. These people would have dealt with famine and disease during the first siege and lived through the destruction and pillage. Since then, they'd seen the city rebuilt, but now they were dealing with a siege all over again. All of it was because of the Assyrians. Babylon finally fell in 648, and Shama Shuma-ukin died. Ashurbanipal wrote about his brother's death this way. He said that the Assyrian gods had cast his hostile brother into the burning flames and destroyed him. At this point, there's a problem. The records begin to dry up. We don't even know the date of the end of Ashurbanipal's reign. 
It was probably around 630 BCE. In 612 BCE, 18 years later, Nineveh was conquered by a coalition of Babylonians and a people from Persia called the Medes. But there aren't any Assyrian records to tell us what happened. The Babylonian sources aren't very helpful either. The Medes seem to have come out of nowhere. So what happened? It does seem as though peace was restored after Ashurbanipal triumphed in the war against his brother. But once Ashurbanipal died, yet another civil war erupted between two princes who both wanted to rule Assyria. And there was a struggle for the throne in Babylonia as well between two Babylonians. In Babylonia, the man who won was named Nabopolassar. He wasn't a member of the previous royal family at all. In Assyria, the prince who was victorious was Sin Shar Ishkun, a son of Ashurbanipal. So guess what happened next? Right, Sin Shar Ishkun and Nabopolassar went to war against one another. By now, these civil wars and wars between Assyria and Babylonia had been going on for more than a hundred years. And yet, in all this time, whenever Babylonia and Assyria had been at war, the battles had always taken place in Babylonia. The Assyrian heartland hadn't been threatened. And eventually, the Assyrians had always won. No army from outside Assyria had ever campaigned into Assyria. Even though the Assyrian cities all had nice big defensive walls, they'd never been needed. But in 617 BCE, Nabopolassar moved his army north up the Euphrates. He didn't threaten the Assyrian heartland yet, but he was able to conquer regions Assyria controlled in the west of the empire. For the Assyrians, this was even worse than losing Egypt, because Egypt had only been under Assyrian control for a very short time. In comparison, the region on the Euphrates had been in the empire for centuries. Three years later, the Medes, from what is now Iran, went on the offensive in the Assyrian heartland. They attacked the big cities, Ashur, Kalhu, and Nineveh, and they conquered Ashur. Think about that. It had been the religious capital of Assyria for more than a thousand years. It was home to their all-powerful god, Ashur. Now it was in the hands of foreigners. Imagine if, say, the Mongols had made it to Italy in the 13th century and had conquered Rome. The effect on the Assyrians was probably something like that. The Medes then joined forces with the Babylonians and the Elamites and kept pushing into Assyria. Two diplomatic letters survive from this time, written by Sinshar Ishkun of Assyria and Nabopolassar of Babylon. They show that the Assyrians were in a very bad position. Today, we can see how this had been building up, and we know the outcome. We know that the Assyrian Empire fell. But at the time, it must have been a huge shock for the Assyrians to realize they were actually in danger. For 300 years, the Assyrian Empire had been the only great power in the Near East. It had been more than 500 years since the Assyrian heartland had been attacked. There was no way to conceive of any other world. But Nineveh fell in 612 BCE, after a siege of only three months. An archaeological expedition from UC Berkeley has found evidence of the siege when they were digging at the city of Nineveh in 1990. The excavation showed that the city's stone gates were beautifully constructed. Originally, they were about 20 feet wide, but the gateways had been hastily narrowed to just six feet with much cruder construction techniques. And this was probably when Assyria was first invaded in 614 BCE. A 20-foot wide gate might have done a fine job of welcoming visitors and traders, messengers and artisans at the height of the empire. But it was way too wide to defend against the Medes and the Babylonians. And there were 15 of these gates. And then the archaeologists found an even more graphic relic of the invasion, a tangled group of a dozen skeletons of men and boys. These weren't formal burials. The bodies were all crumpled, lying right where they'd fallen down. They must have been residents of Nineveh who died when the Babylonians and Medes swept into the city. The skeletons were surrounded by arrowheads, along with a dagger, a spear, and a pike. One 13-year-old boy had an arrowhead still stuck in his leg. The Assyrian army held on 
and made its last stand in the Syrian city of Haran, three years after Nineveh fell. But the end of the Neo-Assyrian Empire is usually dated to 612 BCE, with the destruction of Nineveh. The way the conquerors treated Assyria was horrific. Cities across the heartland were looted, burned, and leveled. Populations were killed or they fled, and most cities weren't reoccupied for decades, if ever. That includes the great capital cities of Ashur, Kalhu, and Nineveh. It was much worse than the way the Assyrians had treated Babylon in the time of Sennacherib. Sarah Melville, a Clarkson University scholar who studies this period, has made a new interpretation of this. She notes that the Babylonian records state that the devastation in Assyria wasn't the fault of the Babylonians. Rather, it was done by the Medes. And the Babylonians claimed that they were shocked by how the Medes had treated the Assyrians. Now, this might sound a little like avoiding the blame, but it might have been true. Remember, the Babylonians and Assyrians shared the same culture, religion, and language. They had a long and complicated relationship, but they respected one another. Melville believes they also shared some rules about combat and about the treatment of defeated enemies. These rules wouldn't have included destroying everything in sight. The usual thing was to take over and rule the conquered cities, not burn them right down. The Medes, however, didn't share their culture and didn't have an organized state, nor did they follow the Mesopotamian rules. As for why Assyria fell, Melville argues that the Assyrians simply weren't prepared to fight defensively. After centuries of being on the offensive, expanding their empire, and not needing to defend it, they made mistakes. They didn't switch to fighting defensively until it was too late, and their cities weren't designed for the change in tactics. Those wide city gates hadn't been built to keep a foreign army out. Of course, there were other reasons for the fall of Assyria as well. As we've seen, the Assyrians were pretty unpopular with many of their subjects, and the long history of Assyrian efforts to control Babylonia had given the Babylonians a good reason to go on the attack. And although the Assyrian administration had no sense of such things as gross domestic product or budget deficits, it looks as though their government was spending much more than it was taking in at this time. Expensive undertakings, like the attempt to conquer Egypt and all those civil wars, had sucked up a lot of wealth. It even looks as though the population was shrinking, which would have reduced tribute and taxes. The very fact that Assyria had started losing wars might also have worsened morale. As long as the Assyrians were always victorious, people probably believed that the god Ashur simply couldn't be defeated. In the Bible, there's a speech by an Assyrian official who obviously believed this. He was trying to convince the people of Jerusalem to surrender before the Assyrian army even attacked. The official says, has the God of any nation ever delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Who of all the gods of the countries has been able to save his land from me? Assyria and the god Ashur just couldn't be resisted. In the end, the Assyrian empire wasn't mourned much. Some writers in the Bible were obviously thrilled to see it fall. And people in other lands might have said similar things. But most of those lands that had been subject to Assyria didn't suddenly gain their independence. The beneficiary of the fall of Assyria ended up being Babylonia. Nabopolassar, the Babylonian king, took control of much of the former Assyrian Empire. But he and later rulers of what we call the Neo-Babylonian Empire were the last indigenous rulers of Mesopotamia for hundreds of years. <laughs>